So I'm a systems architect at my job at Genetech, uh, which basically means that my job is to make diagrams, ask developers to do them, implement them, and when they work well, I take all the merit, and when it doesn't work, I blame them for their failure. Uh, but really, most of it is about uh, making broad, broad plans about uh, big abstract decisions that will cover most of the potential failures we will see while leaving people with enough freedom and uh, local decision making to make a thing that works. Um, most of the plans that we make on the whiteboard don't survive the whiteboard, uh, but I try to stick around and see how we can update the documentation to make everything fit with that. In a way, this is kind of critical because at Genetech, what we're designing are security systems uh, that will run in all kinds of areas from supermarkets, coffee shops, down to airports, or even entire citywide surveillance systems. Uh, they can include stuff like video surveillance, license plate reading, access control, integration to building management, and stuff like that. So there's something quite interesting about these kinds of systems where uh, if there is a failure in production that takes a long time to resolve, uh, you don't just call the operators on their pagers. There's usually something like the military coming down with submachine guns to take over the system that no longer runs, which makes for a good motivator not to have your system fail in production. So uh, th that's where I come in. And uh, the thing that, I, yeah, the eyebrows are really making it. Uh, the thing that I'm really noticing all the time in all the discussions I'm having in the teams there, whether it's related to Erlang or C Sharp or any other language, is that all the kind of terminology that we have in OTP is something that I keep coming back to whenever I design these systems with the people I work with. And so today, that's what I really want to present. Uh, the kinds of things that we do for reliable systems that have to do with Erlang, even if Erlang is not the language we're using in the end, or Elixir or something like that, uh, but there's a lot to learn out of that. So the way I want to start about that is going to be about the areas of knowledge we have in a system. There is this brown orange circle that is the things we know. And the things we know are not that big in the grand scheme of things. We know a few of them. Um, and it's fine. It's going to be a small portion of the code, really. Uh, most of the code that we run and are responsible for is not the code we have written. Uh, we're also answering for the bugs in the OS we deploy to. If you're deploying in the cloud, there's going to be hypervisors and services that you use. You haven't written, but if there is a bug in there, you're still the point of contact for them. Fortunately, the little areas of the bugs that happens in the things we know uh, are quite simple and easy to fix. Most of the time, those are going to be in areas of the code that we understand pretty well. We have an idea about what the ramifications are of all the issues in there. And um, really, uh, it's going to be stuff that you might even have found in a kind of QA phase before you even ship, but you just didn't have the time or budget to fix them. So you know you're going to live with these bugs. Or it might be something like you left a to-do in a comment about handling an error somewhere and just decide, I'm going to do that later, and then you never did it. Uh, and then when there's a failure, it's kind of obvious that's what it could be related to. So those are fine. Uh, a little more annoying part there is the little purple circle that is the things you think you know. And those are the things where we go with a pretty good idea of what the world works like. We never really took the time to validate that. We just went ahead and, say, and, tell, and we just tell ourselves that it would not make sense to run otherwise. And out of any good reason, it always runs differently than what we think it should be. So when we build this big Jenga tower of a software stack that we ship to someone, uh, those assumptions that are in the things we think we know, but that we turned out to be wrong about, are going to always create interesting bugs. If we really have them on the top of the stack, and it might be something like, I don't know, uh, the way we write logs are getting truncated in places we didn't know it's not that big of a deal. But if the wrong assumptions we made about the world were at the bottom of the Jenga tower, then we're in trouble. One of my favorite one for that, uh, and it's because it hit me in production, is that if you use the TCP stack on the loopback interface, you will find that you can detect all kinds of disconnections and all kinds of operations. You send a message over in TCP, and it tells you the connection is broken. If you use the TCP stack on a, for, on a remote interface, like in the real world, these error detections do not happen at all. You just go silently, and it keeps sending messages that never get anywhere, and you don't detect failures. And so if you build your system on that, you're screwed. You just have the wrong way of thinking about the world, and you built your house on it. And it's going to be a garbage house that nobody wants to live in. <laughs> uh, so yeah, how do you react to that? And then you're going to have the, the, the things that is not in a circle there, the things we don't know about. 
Uh, those are fun because the moment you give an example, they no longer fit the category because now you know about them. Uh, but one example would be really of the um, meltdown bug was a super interesting one where you have a, secu a security model, an assumption about how a processor works, security works, and then someone comes with a side channel attack that nobody saw coming, and all of a sudden, all the security that people have built in their systems for years are no longer valid. In a more uh, standard kind of case, I like the thundering herd problem. If you've never heard of the, th uh, of the thundering herd problem, it's whenever you have this uh, system with one or two or a few servers, and then they crash. And when they come back up, all the clients are trying to connect to the same one at the same time and just keep killing it. And so if you haven't planned for that kind of issue, usually with exponential backoffs and um, some jittering in the times that you have, you have a system that once it crashes, you're not able to keep bringing back up. And if you don't control the clients, you cannot do much about it. So really, um, that kind of brings me, ooh, that's the wrong button of the remote. There we go. So, so the kind of bugs that we have, really, the things, the bugs that have to do with the things we know are easy. We tend to, kind of, to understand everything that has to do with them. Uh, what's in the things we think we know, we have to be careful and pay attention. We cannot really avoid them because we don't know all the things we don't know. Uh, but that might happen. And then there's this sweet area of bugs about the things we don't know in code we don't know that just surprise us. And there's really nothing really good to do about it. We can dig hard to try to find them. We can uh, gain knowledge to help us, or we can send our prayers, which tends not to work very well. So the kind of plan is, how do we shift most bugs to the easy category so that they are uh, simple to fix, see coming, and everything? And so the, the simplest way to, to do go about it is to increase the knowledge that we have about our system. Uh, yeah, th that's a valid question. Like, why are all the Elixir questions and Stack Overflow also tagged Erlang? Uh, <laughs> But yeah, the, the simple solution to fixing that one is just to hire more senior developers. That's the really, really easy one. You don't necessarily go wrong with them. You have more senior developers. When you look at the circle, the senior developers tend to know more, at least in the area related to the code, than the other people you have on your team. However, that's not using them smartly. Uh, if you just take a, a senior developer, you send them to a section of the code mine, they build their thing, and then they leave for a higher salary somewhere else because that's how everyone works. Uh, you just end up with a new problem that you have to answer for that nobody understands. That's legacy code. So really what you want to do is to foster a kind of culture internally in your team of uh, learning, teaching, and mentoring. And what you really know, you really know that uh, you have a good thing going where instead of just having to hire a bunch of seniors and then losing a bunch of seniors to turn over over time, you hire a bunch of juniors, but you keep bleeding seniors that used to be juniors. That means that your team as an ecosystem is able to sustain itself by having people train each other without a problem. And that tends to mean that the knowledge is really flowing from a group of people to another group of people, and the knowledge within the team overall is getting better and better. That's what you really want to have in a team. Uh, but another way to increase the knowledge that you have is to look at these circles right there. If this is the area of things that I know, other people on the team are going to have their own circle of areas of things they know. If the only people I'm hiring to work with me are my friends from high school who went to the same school and worked the same jobs as I did, chances are we're going to have the same kind of overlap everywhere. And so we're really more interchangeable with the same perspectives all the time. If what I get is someone with an entirely different technical background or even a non-technical one, then we get a much broader overlap of all the circles that we have in our areas of knowledge. And the really interesting things about that is that what we gain is not just knowledge about the code, it's knowledge about the world overall. So when we are developing new code, we can foresee the bugs happening before they do. If you have ever worked with internationalization or localization uh, with people who speak a single language, you know what it means. If you do it for the first time, these people are going to discover every bug and every view feature of a human language one after the other. If you have people who have experience in that background, or speak multiple languages, they're going to know about these issues before you run into them. To put the principle another way, if you hire a people full of people who love Bitcoin, you're going to get a blockchain as a solution. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's a really an important one to do there. So uh, the other one that we, need, we can do is exploratory testing. Exploratory testing here, I really do mean, yeah. <laughs> It worked on my machine. <laughs> Your machine is going to production. Um, 
<laughs> so exploratory testing in this classical approach is really that you take a developer, that, a, a tester that has good experience, you sit them in front of a computer, you put the program in a terminal, or well, if it's Erlang, it's in a terminal. If it's Elixir, it's a web page. You put them in front of it, and then you let them go at it. It's just like, take notes, tell me what it can do, what it cannot do, and then we're going to figure it out. And that person just explores the programs and finds a crap loads of bugs. And that turns out to be really, really freaking effective in the real world as a way to find stuff. The problem is that it, it, it's time consuming. It's hard to repeat, find regressions, and stuff like that. Uh, I put there other methods. That's where you can do really fun stuff like fuzzing, where fuzzing the approach is really that you have this piece of software that you annotate your code in preparation for. And what it does is just throw garbage at your program until it dies. And what it, you have to prove is that your program dies or doesn't die. And that's fuzzing in a nutshell. So fuzzing is kind of neat, uh, but it just tells you if it's yeah, limping along or dead. Um, what I'm really enthusiastic about is property-based testing, where you kind of take that fuzzing approach, but you couple it with a bit of model checking, uh, albeit in a non-formal manner. And what you do is that you throw garbage at a program, but garbage in a kind of familiar shape, and you prove that your program still behaves correctly rather than just dying or not. And so that, that's what I really enjoy about it. Uh, is that you can really take something, if I have a CRUD application where what I do is let people upload images and stuff, uh, I can generate garbage image data, I can gar generate garbage usernames, I can generate uh, all kinds of bad data like that and make sure that it works. But when it comes to the tools that we have in the airline community, in the Elixir community, specifically with quick check, trick, and proper, uh, is that we can do stateful system tests. And so gen uh, stream data does not really fit like that because it's really, have to do, it's really having to do with the basic tests. But stateful tests are super interesting because instead of just generating data, what you can do is really tell your system that sequences of operations to run on the actual systems are going to be the data set I'm generating. So if I have my CRUD app, I could have uh, operations like logging in, log it out, uh, uploading an image, viewing an image, deleting an image, and those could be the operations I have in my system. And so I can specify rules for them, like a user can only upload an image once they are logged in. They can only see the images that they have uploaded themselves. Uh, if you delete an image, you can no longer see it. And if you upload a second image twice, I don't want it to work if it's a duplicate. And so what you can do is really tell the system, uh, you're going to run against the real thing, throw all these operations at them, and it might generate you a sequence that's going to be super long, like log in, log out, log in, upload, upload, delete, upload, view, delete, blah, 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 150 operations long, and at some point it's going to find an error. And that's where shrinking comes in. The system tries to just remove operations until it finds something simpler. And at the end, we could have a very simple operations like logging in, upload an image, delete the image, and upload the image. And then maybe that broke the rule about duplication because the check that we do for duplicate images was not being correctly unset when we deleted the picture. And then property-based testing can find that for us. That's really exciting because these kinds of explosions can be, that, that, that can be done by a program. It doesn't need to explode in your own face. It can explode in the, pro, in the face of your program. That's better. And so what we get out of all of that is that the overall areas of knowledge that we have increase, both in code and outside of code, if we do that. Another approach that we have is just decreasing the things we don't know. And the easiest way to do that is to not write code. That's the best one. You just don't write code. You stay at home. You do nothing, and then no bugs can happen. Uh, if you are someone who has the time and knowledge for that, you can use formal methods and specifications and use something like TLA+, which is going to really be great in terms of uh, constraining what is possible for you to do or not, and force a good specifications and remove all the surprises. But in short, when we're doing Erlang and Elixir, what we can recommend is probably using Dialyzer, which is really going to do a bunch of uh, analysis to find problems and keeps, uh, keep us from making mistakes. Using linters and code formatters is actually a good idea. If the code is more uniform, and removes kind of shady areas that tend to lend place to errors, we're reducing the areas where misinterpretation by readers can happen. Uh, let it crash is going in there, in my opinion, from the simple point of view that if you receive data that is a bit misshapen, you don't like it, the user didn't really intend it to be that way, and the only thing you do is you kind of hammer it into the shape you want, what you end up with is data that neither the user wanted nor the system can understand. And you're just pushing it down through the system, and you give 
place to all kinds of emergent behavior and nasty surprises. It's usually a much better idea to fail early and often because as you keep all the errors on the boundaries and the edges of the systems, yes, they are more visible, but they are far less likely to emerge as surprising behavior interacting of various subcomponents that are now stuck with data they don't know what to do with. Just kill it early and be done with it. Uh, if you can afford it, yes, do use formal tools. They work. They're just a bit more trouble, uh, not trouble, but more effort. And then uh, one thing I find super interesting in there is the idea of observability. I don't know if anyone here is super familiar with the concept, uh, but I will show it that way, which is that uh, when you find a bug about something you thought you knew or you didn't know, it's usually coming as a surprise, which means that you are very unlikely to have any logs or metrics about it. Whenever that problem happens, you need to dig into it and do a kind of development cycle of exploration and testing your hypothesis, and it's a very scientific approach to solving the problem, but the current logs you have don't matter. If you turn out to work uh, in airports like we do, uh, it might be two years before someone uploads or updates their software. So two years is quite a long debugging cycle, which I think is not really great. Um, it's much better if you have a platform like uh, the Beam Virtual Machine and Erlang Elixir, everything that you can do, tracing, introspection, getting metrics, all that stuff, you get friendly with these. Because all the nasty bugs are going to be bugs in places you didn't think they would be coming. If you thought they would be there, they wouldn't be surprises. So embrace that. Um, then I have this, oh, damn. That's a Microsoft computer. It's frozen. Oh, there we go. Woo. Yeah, I love that picture with that quote. It's whenever you sit near the sales staff at lunch and they look at you that way. Uh, this is a slide about irrelevance, which is the feeling you feel when they look at you in that manner. I love that one. <laughs> so uh, I'm picking irrelevance here because architecture in software has broad patterns that we can apply to the code in the system that lets us handle errors without knowing what they are. The simplest example is having a failover copy of uh, a server or a node or a system so that any failure whatsoever for whatever cause it is, might it be broken hardware or just bugs in the code, someone tripping on a power cord, as long as it ends up in the other node dying, another one can catch up for it and handle it in itself. And so architecture patterns uh, kind of let us handle these unexpected faults that we know nothing about really, really easily. And what's interesting about Erlang and Elixir is that we can do it, but within the software. And the supervisors are the basic way to do that. I don't know how familiar people in this room are with supervisors, so I'm going to go over really quickly. Uh, there's three broad strategies, one for one. If the child dies, it's the only one restarted. Rest for one, it implies a linear dependency between children. Uh, C depends on B, which depends on A. If any one of them dies, you need to kill the other ones. It lets you build a chain of all the supervisors and workers that you have. One for all is basically what you use when there's a dependency between all of the children. And if one of them goes away, it's really kind of tricky to repair their state to make it work. So it's just simpler to kill them all and go back to a non-stable state and start from there. These three things are all we need along with uh, these strategies. A permanent child is a child that will get restarted no matter what. A transient child will only get restarted if it failed in an error. If it failed properly, you figure out it's done, it's fine. A temporary child, nobody really knows what it does until you really need it. It does nothing, but it's super useful. <laughs> Trust me, it is. So this is a bit of an exercise that I do with every, th every team I work with when it comes to architecture of Erlang systems and systems that are not even in Erlang which has to do about thinking about how a system boots and shuts down. Almost all the systems we work on end up having something that looks like this. On the left side, there's going to be a database and a queue with all kinds of software in there, which is the person operating or using the software, they tell you what they want in it. It's going to be, if it's a queue, it's a bunch of actions being sequenced in there. If it's a database, it could be a configuration, it could be storage. Here I put an IP device because everyone does networks all the time, but it could be a camera, it could be a web server, it could be anything you want. What your system tends to do is take the orders from there and send them to that place and do an operation on there, or take the data from that IP device and carry it to the other side where the user can look at it. That's the basic data flow of almost every system. And then there's tiny storage in there uh, because we don't write fast. 
And so we start with the root supervisor. And the first thing we do is that we start a, a thing on the left side that's going to let us communicate with that. Supervision always starts depth first, left child first, synchronously, which means that uh, as I start, let's say, the SQL supervisor, it's going to start its worker, and when they connect, then it can start all the other ones. And only one that subtree is in place can I start the second one that might be working with Kafka. And then it has its own workers. Next thing I might want to do, uh, report metrics. I want the metrics to be available to the rest of the system, so I start them right away. I start the metrics after the reporting values in there, because it's possible the metrics are pushing them to either Kafka or SQL, for example. But the order I put in the tree tells me how my system boots. Oop, still pressing the wrong buttons on the remote. Uh, then I might have a local configuration because I find out that talking to database all the time is really, really slow. If I'm working on a customer side, it's possible that I might not have a connection for two weeks at a time there. So it might be interesting to store a local copy of it. I'm going to keep it in that stable in the supervisor. I'm going to have a worker to dump it to disk so that if I restart, I get all the data I need. And then I can start actually polling or talking to my devices. And that might require a little worker in there that's going to talk to a device. Uh, if I look into one of them, it might use a little supervisor, a little state machine that holds the state of whatever it talks to. So if it has to report changes, it needs to track them, and then I might have a process that tracks the connections to the device. So that's fine. That tells me how my system boots. It boots in that order, and when I shut it down, it usually shuts down in the reverse order that way. And I know that everything happens right and in order. And so I have a very good idea of how my system is going to run before I even write it. Uh, but that's garbage. Nobody cares about how a system works. I want to know how it fails or how it works when it's supposed to be failing right now. And so the kind of little standard exercise I do with every team I work with is to just try to kill it. If I kill that worker, what do I want to happen to these other ones? Do I want them to die with them? It's a database connection. No, I don't want them to die. It's going to be one for one, same thing for the other one. Then I can ask the question, what if there's something bad with the database and they keep dying all the time and that one dies? Do I want the Kafka subtree to die? Probably not. There are two different storage engines, so I can put a one-for-one -one strategy on that one. I can do that from the other side of the tree. If the connection dies, do I want the state machine that I maintain on the side to survive or die as well? If it's an HTTP request, there's nothing to retry. Maybe I want it to die. If what I'm doing here is recording data and maybe uh, tracking motion detection on a camera, then I want it to stay alive, and I can use a REST for one and get rid of the little link in between so that if the state machine dies, the connection gets reset automatically. If the connection dies, then the state machine comes back up, and that's fine. Then I, I just do that with the entire tree. If I kill one of the devices there and it no longer connects, should I, should I be killing the other ones? Probably not. I can use a simple one-for-one -one supervision tree. And that's how you go. But then as you go up in the tree, these answers become harder and harder to answer. And so I might be asking, if I kill this entire side, maybe this is like one network interface talking to a part of the world, and this one is an entirely different network, and that entire section goes down for a long period of time. Maybe someone tripped a wire. Uh, maybe uh, in the case of an airport, it might be a terrorist attack, and there's no connections. What do you do? Do you stop operating all the cameras and just die, or you keep going? Uh, you can ask similar questions. If I kill the configuration worker, can I still work with these? What happens in these cases? And so you get these hard questions, and usually uh, we might be tempted to try to solve them by just patching the code. Uh, but I'm not touching code there. The only thing I'm going to do is patch the supervision tree. And you just have to add a layer of supervision. So what I can do there is that if I put a one for one supervision layer in there, I keep the same semantics I had before for that part of the tree. But if, if that entire section dies, I know that this section can keep going. That one has a local cache. The pollers can keep working. They won't be reporting to anything, but they can still keep accumulating data in the state machine. By adding layers of supervision, I'm able to do that. And once I'm maybe satisfied with that, I can ask the same question again. Maybe that device keeps dying. That camera has gone bonkers. Someone has installed some uh, botnet garbage in there even before we came in. It's just killing my system. When that happens and it dies 50 times a second, what do I do? Do I keep trying to restart it, or do I give up? And this is where a temporary supervisor becomes interesting. Because that one here can have a high level of tolerance for bullshit and failure. Uh, but if it trips it, that one supervisor there, I can put it as a temporary worker. And so if it fails too often, I just give up on that one. I abandon one device or one server I'm trying to pull to save the entirety of the system. Then the question is, how do I start to do that again a bit later and retry? 
And one of the comments we see a lot online is we need a smarter supervisor. What if the supervisor had a cool down period? And I kind of disagree with that. I don't want a smart supervisor because smart systems make dumb mistakes. What I want instead is just to have a little process on the side that's going to act as a brain. I'm just adding a brain to the, super the supervisor I want to remain stupid and simple because I know how it works and I'm going to get only bugs that are easy to understand in it. Uh, if I add the brain on the side, then I get that new contact point, and that one is free to do whatever I want it to do. It can scan the entire supervision tree to know what's running or not, comparing it with the database of configuration and restart what it wants on the frequency it wants with the reporting it wants. And it has nothing to do with my supervisor. My supervisor supervises. That one manages. And so just by doing that, I have entirely decided how my system is going to fail. I have defined its state of partial failures what is going to be a legal state for it to be in or not? And I have zero code written. And usually that's where the kind of exercise stops. And then the team just goes like, I know exactly how to implement the system now. And they go with it and they just code the workers and the rest is taken care of. All the resiliency and fault tolerance is baked into the program structure itself. So um, the other kind of question that we have is that, yeah, that's a good plan. How do we make sure that the supervision tree is going to work the way we want it to do? The first tip I can give is to handle only the certain things. Uh, if you've read my little blog post in the past about it's about the guarantees, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So we have to think about the failure modes. If I'm going back to my database, and I know the database is on a, a different network or something, I have to know it's going to fail at some point. So when I get a disconnection from the database, do I kill the worker that maintains the connection, or, I just, or do I just have a worker that can represent the idea that the database is unreachable? If the kind of fault I have is easy to see as an expected and happening, then fine, just return the idea of the tuple error disconnected. Let the caller handle the error in the smartest way they know. If we just always fail, uh, even when we know how to handle the error, we're taking away the choice of the caller handling the system. And so we want to leave that choice when possible to whoever can. And if they cannot deal with it, they can just do something like really uh, crash on it by pattern matching the wrong thing. That's like an assertion. They die and they go. I will want to really deal with the unknown exceptions of the things like reconnections and everything. If I know I'm going to have to reconnect, I want to handle it. Only when I get in a non-known state or a state that I consider risky to be in do I want to crash and start over again from a non-stable state. The other interesting thing is going to be the dead letter cues. And I love this painting. This is, I think, the Mongol hordes re responding to the Ottoman Empire about bowing down to them and just telling them, go pound sand. Uh, it's a great painting. But anyway, dead letter queue. If you're talking with Kafka with a RabbitMQ or something like that, you're receiving orders for a client and you cannot drop them on the ground, uh, you're going to get a problem sooner or later. What you have is a system that is entirely stalled. And that can be not because the input is wrong, but because you're doing a deploy right now. If you have five nodes in the system and three of them are in the future versions and there are new messages in there that the older versions cannot understand, they will crash when they receive them. And so that's interesting, and that's why you want a dead letter queue. A dead letter queue is giving that kind of exit door for your program to say, I don't know how to deal with this. I need an adult. They put it in the queue, and then an adult, which is a person usually really disappointed of being paged at 3 in the morning, is going to look at them and say, oh, that's just a stupid message, and requeue it for later or fix it. But you kind of need them. That's when the computer cannot do things, and you have to give them a way to do that. Uh, the other one is uh, slow down, really. Exponential backups and circuit breakers. Exponential backups are going to be about the thundering herds, a bit like I mentioned. If you're trying an operation and it fails, it's really easy to start busy looping extremely rapidly until everything goes out of balance and explodes. Uh, circuit breakers are nice because you can see them as a preemptive way of bailing out when stuff starts going bad. A circuit breaker is going to be, for example, if a request that usually has an SLA of 500 milliseconds, which is very generous, starts taking 750 milliseconds or more, you start denying and aborting these operations before they even take place. So before the system topples over in pain and misery, you just back off and let it recuperate uh, for a brief period of time. And that tends to let you oscillate into areas of relative stability rather than really going from everything works and everything is on fire, everything works and everything is on fire. The circuit breaker lets you just be in a warm room for a while. Um, 
Yeah, and so how do you know that your supervision tree is right or that you implement it right for the problems you have? A uh, basic solution is going to be chaos engineering, the same kind of stuff that Netflix does with the chaos monkey. The problem is that the chaos monkey, you kind of run it in production all the time, and that's a bit annoying. Um, I mentioned property-based testing. Something that's really cool with a supervision tree that we have like that is that we do have the ability to say that if that worker dies, I know that there should be expectation that this one doesn't die unless I run into the maximum values that I have there. And if that worker dies, there's no reason why this supervisor or this supervisor should be exploding right now. No reason for it. And so what we can do is probably write properties for that. And that's a little demo. Oh, yeah, I worked very hard on that slide. Uh, there's a little demo I wrote where uh, it starts with a simple library that scans the entire supervision trees of your applications for all the apps that you can have and you can decide to only use, for example, Oh, yeah, that's a list. There you go. And that it's just going to find the supervision trees you need with the workers you need, and there's a few annotations in there. And what's interesting with it is that as a property, this is what I can use. I'm going to have a very simple thing where I boot the system, make it work. And this is a statem call where I can just mark some process as going to die. And in the little application that I have in that process, if it dies, it's going to be a worker like that that just sends requests to a database. If it dies in a painful manner that breaks the supervision tree by propagating the model I expect to have, it's going to tell me about it and report the errors as if the way I implement my supervision tree does not map with the declaration of the tree itself. And it found a problem really, really rapidly where, uh, where some failures happen too often. There's a problem. The output is not great. Uh, frankly, there's a list of them where yeah, if you call something like Mark has dead, it's too often, it's going to explode the system. And so the thing you could do really is to, um, at that point, just prevent that or catch the failure. But we can also tag the system so that everything related to the database, for example, is not going to die on its own. Uh, for these, I'm not going to kill them. I expect the database, when there's a disconnection or something like that, to return an error value instead of just dying. So if I were to run that one, Usually, it should be working fine. Oh, there's something I broke in the demo. That's really smart. <laughs> Jesus. Let's go to something that I know works, uh, where I mocked a DB call that should be failing. Let's bring the worker back. Oh, yeah, that was the return value that was wrong. OK. Let's get back on track there. So I had the thing not tagged as a database. The worker shouldn't be dying because I do and all the failure fine. But you know, that's, that's a good example for the test case anyway. So it's run the test, and now it should work, hopefully, for that case. Ah, god damn it. All right. <laughs> I swear it works. There was a video of an Elixir conference two weeks ago where it works. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's try with that one. That's what happens when you patch your demo really early. Let's try it that way. If that one works, then I can just reverse the work of that one into something that made sense. All right, it seems to work. It's going to be really, really freaking slow uh, because I do give the time to errors to propagate in the tree. And so answer your phone, dude. All right. Uh, so yeah, the, the kinds of failures that I have supported right now is really the idea that you can mark some failures as only happening for uh, processes that you want to die or not want to die with tags. And the tags are just entries in the process dictionaries. I scan the entire tree, and I know that for a given call, I don't want to kill them. I have a thing where I can do fault injection with mocking success. Well, mocking success is that I put an error condition such that uh, it returns a disconnection, and I expect nothing to die out of that. And so what happens in, uh, let's make sure that it still works. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's still working. That's good. So if instead of handling error disconnected as a condition I could expect to have, I just had something like error bad arg or something, and it turns out not to be logical, then the system is going to know that the fault injection I'm driving into my system by the model of the supervision tree causes the failures that prevent it to work. And that one should fail really, really quickly, usually. And yeah, it's kind of dying and telling me, uh, 
on some calls that you had on the mock success on everything, and I really need to work on the stack traces I show for that one. Uh, but it's telling you that because of that errors in that specific worker, that's called sub DB worker with a connect to something in there, the process didn't exist, and I had a failure in there that happened. But really, if I just do the disconnection and I handle it fine, uh, then the tests run for a long period of time and eventually work. And that's the kind of interesting approach that we have with that one, is that just because the supervision tree itself encodes failure semantics, what I can do with that kind of property test is kill random processes and give them failure faults and make sure that the propagation that I see in my system maps what I declared. So when that worker here died instead of disconnecting, and I caused a problem in that one that kept repeatedly crashing until that supervision tree died, that property finds about that. It just discovers that, oh, there's a supervision tree that died somewhere that had no business dying because of that. And it can find the faults in how I implemented the expected structure of my system by looking at just a supervisor declaration. And so if I do not handle things properly, even if the types are valid, it finds these kinds of propagation faults in there. Uh, and then what can we add on top of that, really, because that's super useful? Because everything is in order, if I have some kind of supervisor, not necessarily the root that I put as a REST 4.1, I can put all my kind of pre-dependencies of my systems in there in a first worker that's going to check the dependencies. If I have a local database or a local service that I expect to run, like I don't know, syslog or something, and it's not there, then my system will refuse to boot. As long as the thing is there, then the stuff can keep going. So locally on my single machine, I can do that. Then I have my external circuit breakers that I can have. If I'm working in a distributed systems or microservices, I can put just a child in there that follows my entire application subtree. And that is the one that just decides to say that when we have a health check, we, re we respond positively. Uh, I'm registering myself to a router or maybe a DNS service for service discovery. And so what's interesting is that if my application is unhealthy in major ways, or a part of it is unhealthy, that circuit breaker, by virtue of being in part of the supervision trees, automatically can unregister and register my application in the system. And so what I have is uh, suddenly a kind of smart application that knows when to remove itself from the, from the system or get back into it just because I encoded things properly in my supervision tree, no matter what the error that caused it was. That's pretty cool. And so, um, yeah, we can even apply that to other architectures. If you look at these kind of architecture diagram from uh, Cynthia Schroederam or uh, Copy Construct uh, from her previous jobs, those, this is the microservice architecture they had in their systems. If you flip it 90 degrees, it's really damn close to a supervision tree where you have really that kind of flow of what depends on what. And so when you start to apply these patterns in there, it gets to be interesting about how can you encode the failures of the broad systems into a local one. And so uh, that's the too long didn't listen. Uh, that's not an R, that should be an L, didn't listen. Increase the things you know uh, by good practices, hiring and everything, fuzzing, fault injection, testing. Decrease the areas unknown by being a bit stricter about what you do and make the unknown things relevant uh, through architecture patterns that you have. I've got image credits. They're going to be on slides online if you want it. Most of them are copyright-free pictures and it went classical paintings. Uh, yeah, that was me. We're hiring, but mostly in Montreal, Quebec City, and Sherbrooke, all in Quebec. So thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so when you design a new component or a new subsystem with a new API... Yeah, in the microphone. When you... Go ahead. You got a pretty good voice. Everyone should hear it. So um, I'm going to return error values if I know that the error condition should be pretty frequent. It was the same kind of thing as when you deal with file handling. Usually, you'll see people return like the file doesn't exist as an error value, but the disk is entirely full as a kind of exception, because you can plan to handle one, but not the others. So if I'm writing something that's like a client to a database, I expect the database to not usually be in the same host as the system that's going to be calling for it. So the client should return an error value for these. Uh, the exception, when I raise an exception or an error, is usually because of a programming fault that is going to require a programmer intervention to fix. 
So if I expect the caller to make a decision on it, it is a value. If I expect that even if the other system that calls me cannot make a smart decision because I locally have no idea what that decision should be, I raise an exception because I don't expect them to be able to do that. And of course, if they disagree with me, they can use a try catch. And if they disagree with me with the return value, they can just pattern match on OK something and die when they can't. So there is always the choice in there. Uh, but I do like the values for that because, first of all, it's easier to type check, for example, uh, for them. But it also makes it explicit that you have to possibly handle that value. So that, that's really how I make that decision, usually. It's really about what do I expect the caller and the user of the library to want to do with it. Yes. Well, wait for the microphone, anyway. In the slide where you show how to keep the supervisor dumb and have a smart component handling it, yep. is there a pattern? Is there a code, a library to use for that? Or is it just? It's, it's not really, I mean, we like to say that we don't have design patterns in functional programming. All we do is pass a function to it. But I think that's a design pattern. Uh, there's no strict library way of doing it or encoding it, because it's really a very specific or application-specific stuff. Like if, you read, if you need to read the data from the configuration to impact that one and everything, uh, I don't have a really great way of thinking of, you know, turning it into a behavior that's going to be uh, add-on supervisor or something, or supervisor brain. So I I'd say it's a high-level design pattern that so far we haven't found a good strict encoding for. If we have one, then nice, that's even better. But right now, it's just a loose pattern like that. Yes? Is the idea of uh, testing supervisor condition trees with proper, is that like a, something that you kind of created, or for example, on the website, um, or is it just kind of a novel idea? To, uh, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it novel, because I don't know that I'm the first one to have that idea with it. Uh, but I decided to do it because I thought, uh, while writing propertesting.com, that it would make sense to have that kind of more generic test about how that things goes, or at least give the library to test the supervision tree. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, I haven't tested it with uh, super real world apps yet to test all the tolerance. I'm planning on doing that in the upcoming weeks or months. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd like to see it as a. Uh, more of a thing. I don't know if I'm the first one to think about it or to try it, but I'm, I'm figuring that chaos engineering is a pretty well-known discipline otherwise. So it might be the first one in there. Uh, like, I mean, like, a nice stepping stone to like plus or something along those lines, right? I mean, it's, it's I mean yeah. So the comment for the recording is that, is that a nice stepping stone to TLA plus or something like that? Uh, maybe, I mean, maybe in the sense that it gives you a bit more certainty in the errors that you make. Uh, but no, in the sense that it's absolutely not a formal method. And TLA plus should give you a certainty that the way you structure your thing is right or not. That one is uh, throwing garbage at your app and seeing that, yeah, it's probably doing the right thing. So it's, yeah, it's maybe an in-between between just hoping that it does the right thing and getting a formal model. So that one is kind of a nice compromise in certainty. But it's certainly not trustable to the same level as a formal proof would be. Yeah, I'll be here all weekend. All right.